don't really fail cash flow statements because you don't know cash flows. But the thing is, your cash flows. Alright, so I'm saying your, your cash flow statement is a, it's basically a function of the number of standards. Which means if you don't understand ISC, you can't answer the same question because you can't find cash movement for PBE. If you don't understand IFS2, you won't be able to identify the non cash movement, which would be that. So when you look at cash flows, it's more about understanding the structure for cash flows. But the rest of the maths, they are actually derived from other standards, which means you need to understand a whole lot of other standards. Now, which also means that when you practice cash flow statements, in the process you're also practicing other standards. It's actually good to do a number of cash flow questions which you prepare for your year. It gives you a rundown of if you understand what they understand. Now, for tonight, what we'll do is uh, first we'll talk about the employee benefits. I think that will take us probably an hour. And then after employee benefits, we'll talk about cash flow statements. Uh, that will take probably another hour. And then in the third hour, it's just probably the rundown of some major topics uh, that you need to be worried about as you get to the end of the exam. Not to say the cap. <laughs> right. So employee benefits. I'm hoping that everyone bought you bought your standards. Yes. So let's work with standards. I need to get your your ice cream set. Thank you. 
Uh, let's start with LinkedIn. What are the forms of LinkedIn? So number one, you got uh, you just not send it. I was expecting that to come from the lady. Okay. Uh, what else? Uh, I said it. I
So, as you work for the employer, the employer is obliged to contribute, which means at the point which you provided the service, that's on the obligation of the which means that's when the expenditure is supposed to be counted for. So, that's the whole situation that we have when we do the employee benefit. Now, coming back to compensation benefits, state is what things these days. All of these data comes. Now, the question is if we have got a 31 December year and you are entitled to, uh, how many days uh, dates do you get? The 14. The 14 days. You have finished your CTA. So, uh, you're breaching your ITC. Which means you've got nothing to do for eight months until you write ITC. So, by the time you get to the end of the year, you've got 14 days unutilized. Can you take those 14 days and throw them into next year? Say, I now have 28 days. So, you can't. But it's like, if you're, you're 2021 and you're not planning on getting married anytime soon. Then you get pregnant at 28. Can you go to the club like I've got accumulated three months from the age of 21? <laughs> about who in your fertility is? <laughs> so the first thing that the standard appreciates is these days they need to be broken down into two. You've got days which are accumulating and you've got days which are non-accumulating. So when you get to the end of the year, if you don't utilize the data, there are some days which fall away by the virtue of getting to the end of the reporting period. Whilst there are some days where if you get to the end of the reporting period, you can carry them over into the reporting period. Now, let's create a problem. If your days are going to fall away, let's say one is <coughs> From 1 January <coughs> to 31 December, the employer owes you 14 days of service. When you get to 31 December and you do not utilize those days, what happens to the obligation? It falls away. Which means as we report for 31 December, or as we report for any financial for all the days which are not carried over into the following year. That means all of those days, the obligation relationship them fall away, which means there is no present obligation to the employer. So I don't need to account for anything. Agree. But we've got some days which are accumulated, such as your annual, where if you've got 21 days to accrue, and you don't use those 21 days, when you get into the following year, you now have 21 from last year plus 21 again for this year, which translates to 42. So by the time you get to the end of the 42, if those 21 days is not reduced, then the employer has an obligation to have those 21 days. Yes. Now, if they have got a present obligation, for it to be Accounted for, we need to look at the elements of the financial statement. We have got assets, liabilities, equity, um, revenue, and expenses. Which one is likely to be issued back? Likely to be a liability. Now, for something to be a liability, you need to prove a number of things. Number one, to the present obligation. Number two, for resolution to take place, there should be probability of outcome. Number three, it should be measured last. And I should know when it's due for payment. Now, if you put a liability such as this one, the challenge which I have is do I know the value for the day that you work for? Can I calculate what is the salary per day? I can, which means the amount, I'm good, I'm happy with the amount here. So the amount is not. So measure is like tick. The next question is. Where is the outflow taking place? Now, do we know when this guy is going to take place? 
No. So we've got one element which is uncertain, which is the time. Now, when you've got a liability of uncertain time, what does it become? It becomes a provision. So that means for my accumulating debt, I'm probably waiting with a provision as at the end of the year. Because I've got a present obligation now to give you those days that you work. But I don't know the time of when you're going to take me. So as a reporting thing, I need to account for that obligation. I need to create a liability in my books. But then that liability is a provision in the moment since one of the two is uncertain. At least to that extent. Right. Now, if you ever heard the which is there, when you bought these accumulating things, these accumulating days are further broken down into two, which is bursting and non-bursting. Now, please do not confuse the word bursting, which is in IFS 2, and the word bursting, which is in IS 9. When we are in IFS 2, what does bursting mean? Uh, entitlement. So you'll be entitled to the share based uh, uh, payments it's after saving one, two, three, or after certain conditions. Now, when you come to S19, what does the word first mean? When it cannot be entitled to you, what you're entitled to the that's the meaning of time. What does what does it mean? <laughs> that is important. Please, come to me. It's okay. First thing, what was from your prior reading? What does what does first mean? Okay, you can give me your thoughts, then we can start from there. Right, yes. Thank you. So, when you're looking at bursting from an ice 19 foot, the word first thing you're talking to, are you going to receive the benefits in cash? Or are you entitled to a cash benefit? Now, normally, for lead data, I guess you're supposed to go there. I think from, uh, from your audit course, we also even looked at that way. When you got a guy who doesn't go with it, then it becomes, it becomes a risk area. Now, why are you not going to this? <laughs> so, ideally, a person should go into it. So that other people can come and look at what you're doing. And then we can figure out where you're still in mind. But now you've got, you've got certain people who um, you can't force them to go on leave. Which is when you now move away from audit and you go to Mark. Mark then talks about strategy and decision making. You've got key people in the organization who drive the organization who cannot afford to go on leave for 21 days in a year, which is usually your executive. So now those people, they're given options. Where you can, please go and rest. But where you cannot, then you can you can cash in the debt. Which means that's when we've got uh, what do you call it? Cash in one wow. Exactly. So we've got that situation now where your days can be paid in in, uh, in cash. Now let's come back to the account. The first thing I want to look at, let's talk about the accounting 
um, for numbers, they will talk about the accounting for this. Uh, now, if it's numbers, what it simply means is you can get the date in progress. If you if you don't go to work for 22 days, which is the full month, and to employ those 22 days, they are compensated basically. What is the total cost to the employee? So I say if you go and leave for 22 days, which means the other days that this will be you had a full month when you didn't come to work. But your employer says those these days they're compensated. Now, what is the full cost to the employer during that month that you didn't come to work? So your employer is going to pay you a salary. Is there anything else that the employer pays? The benefits such as Okay, yeah, your house is you know, <laughs> transport, yeah, the hardship allowance. <laughs> but what else? On top of what goes in, into your bed? Thank you. Okay, over and above what they give you, they also contribute a certain portion towards the, uh, the mandatory contribution. Which means there are certain contributions that you share 50 50. Which ones are they? NASA. What else? Uh, your the medical aid, your the pension, those that this year, blah blah blah. You still remember that stuff. Which means the total cost to the employer is not basically what's sitting on your PC. But it's over and above that. So now when we want to look at the full value or the full cost to the edges of a day that you're not at work, that cost is beyond the salary. What you need to do now is for me to be able to create the value for this provision, the measurement of this provision, what I need to know is how many days are they which um, which have not been used as a reporting date? Of those days, are all of those days expected to be utilized in future? Because for anything that we do not expect to utilize in future, that means we're not we're not expecting an outflow. So there's no probability of outflow in the future. If there's no probability of outflow, there is all liability. So my liability or my provision is only to the extent of what I believe will be utilized. Now you will then see in your case study that your case study talks about you got the number of employees which are there. Of those employees, you got a certain number of employees which are expected to resign before they utilize their days. You've seen that before. Which means if you're not going to utilize your days, I don't need to create a provision for those days today. So I will first need to calculate the number of days which are expected to be used, multiply by the number of people. From there, I need to multiply by the salary per day so that I can find the full provision amount. Now the salary per day is the issue. For that salary per day, you need to watch out for, have you been given the costs, which is basically the salary, or you've been given the salary plus the contribution. If an employee is actually going to take the dates, then the amount that I need to use is the salary plus the contribution, which I've been paid. Now, what if you decide to um, cash in? Let's say they are first. So that means we are not expecting you to actually take the dates, but rather
the 22 days that you've actually worked for. We definitely know we're going to pay you the salary, we're going to pay your contributions to NASA. Agreed. For the days that you've cashed in, we'll obviously pay you the full basic salary. Now, do we go and contribute to NASA? No, we don't. Which means your measurement for your provision depends on how the days are going to be uh, to be extinguished. If the days will be extinguished by actually going on leave, you need to include the contributions. If the days are going to be extinguished by catching them in, you need to exclude the contribution. Should I have a page? Yes. Where? <laughs> Wait, is the echo working fast? Is that working? Um, <coughs> yeah, I don't know what the remote is. Okay, they'll fix the echo in a few minutes. I'm sure I was thinking would be much better. Now, let's read. Our set for measurement purposes, the provision is based on the salary date. And that salary Affected by a number of things. The first thing is affected by who do we expect to take the days? The person we don't expect to take the days, we don't read the provision. Those who expect to take the days, we read the provision. That's the first part. The second part is for those who are going to take the days, the cost to the employer depends on how you utilize the days. Whether you are sitting at home or you are chasing them. If you can sit at home, during the month that you're sitting at home, I need to pay your salary. I need to make your contribution. So it doesn't matter that you didn't come to work. Your nyara should still be paid. Your dog should still be paid. Your nana should still be paid. Which means for every leave day that I'm giving you, that you're not, you're taking and you're not coming to work. My cost is what I'm putting the bed plus but if you decide to say, look, my friend, don't worry about me going on this. Just give me the money. <clears throat> then the cost of the employer is now to the maximum of what they are paying in your paper. Was a request for a payment? With the request for a payment, I don't need to make any contributions to anyone. Because for the month of January, for example, which is the month that you didn't cash. For that month, you've already worked. The contributions that I was just to do are those related to the salary for general. That one, you cash in you, that you cash in. I don't need to make a contribution for that. So that means for your provision amount, for someone who's going to take the date, the provision will be higher. For someone who's going to cash the date, the provision will be lower. Now, the accounting bit the journal entries. In the year that they create the provision, I know the journal entries are very Now, in the year that we then take the leave, that's where journal entries might be a problem. So let's start with an easy one. You are 22 days worth of leave. Uh, your salary per day is $15. Now, those 
21 days, they can only accumulate for two. After two years, they fall out. Now, the HD is expecting that this employee is going to take 10 days next year and five days the following year. What journal entry should we read at the end of 21? 21 people, 21 days worth of leave, all of them not taken. <coughs> Expecting that 10 will be taken in 2020, 5 will be taken in 2021. Then the leave days can only accumulate for two It's only accumulate for two years. Which means at the end of 2019, we we'll send them to accumulate for 2020 and for 2021. You don't take all of them at 2021. So what journal entry should we raise for 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 those 21 days? And the 21 December 2019. Okay, thank you. We are only expecting the employee to utilize 15 of the 21, which means we only raise the provision to the extent of 15. So my provision becomes 15 days multiplied by salary per day, which is large, 15 a day. That becomes my provision amount. Then we got 21. But is that because it's present? I can break the ice credit provision. <laughs> what is that? Employment, employment cost. So employee benefits, anything that you want to call it as long as it's a light item which is related to employee benefits. Correct. So that employee benefit cost credits the provision. Now, do you realize we are creating the provision in 2019? Because we're saying that is when you end the day. So that's when you work for them. If you then check them in 2021, that is now the pain inside the day. That has nothing to do with generating the transaction. <coughs> now, let's go to 2020. Let's say in 2020, this guy then takes uh, the five days. Uh, of ten. The ten days leave in general. So what journal entry do you raise for general? What journal entry do you raise? The guy then actually goes. So at the end of uh, at the end of the month, the guy then receives uh, fifteen dollars per day and twenty two days which the guy is went for <coughs> credit bank that amount. And then it what? Debit provision. Okay. But the balance the general one balance. Agreed. Mm -hmm. You're debiting provision by how much? By one fee. Okay. That relating to the 10 days on. Mm -hmm. Then the other then it becomes uh, <laughs> <laughs> Your journal entry is not balanced. Your journal entry is for 22 days credit back. Then then you say 10 days. So I think they are four days left. Now, do you agree that 
This guy is far in his sentence or her sentence is content. This guy only contributed 12 days of service. Agree? Which means the expense to the end is also related to the 12 days of service. If we then raise the salary of 22 days, that becomes incorrect. Make sense? Okay. Hmm. Where were we? Pretty bad. Okay, so you pay salary. You pay your bank is. So we have paid full amount for the 22 days. Now those 22 days that we have paid to our bank account, they are paying for what? That becomes the bill. So what are you paying for? You paid for 12 days which we worked for this year. You also paid for 10 days which we worked for last year. So for the 10 days, the expense was already raised last year. When you say today, you can pay them straight provision. So for this year, you only work for this, that means I'll raise only for and it's an equal event only for the four days. That is the correct accounting which is supposed to have. Now you don't see that in practice. The tax is what you see here. Debit, salary is for amount, which is going to the bank. Credit is back to the bank. Then they go to the provision account. They recalculate the provision which is there at the end of the current day. If that provision has moved, the movement is going to knock off the salary, which effectively becomes the same thing. The okay. So there are two ways of doing it. So if you see an accountant who has gone the other way or first rate uh, full salary and then knocking off the salary with the movement in the provision, please don't interrogate and pressure that person. <laughs> <laughs> they have simply gone the wrong way. But ultimately, you get to the same position. It's the same thing that we used to do. You remember when you read provision for better, you look for the movement in the provision. That becomes your expense or best of an expense. So that's the same thing. Okay. Now, here is what creates a problem. When we were here, we agreed that you don't raise the provision for non accumulation. Agreed? Well, the obligation falls away at reporting date. So you only raise the provision for the accumulated things. However, there's one circumstance where you may end up recognizing a provision for non-accumulated things. Now, let's say that you have got a financial reporting period to start from January to December. You employ a person which means their normal employment cycle runs from July to June next year. <coughs> By the time they get to that one December, they have not utilized their days. But they can still utilize them in general. But you need to report it from the one December. Agreed. So which means that these annual days are non accumulated by the time we get to 31 December, if this guy has worked for five of the days, they're entitled to five days. Those five days, we still need to make an assessment as to whether those days will be used in the next coming six months. Because if they'll be used in the next coming six months, then that means to the extent of those five days, we now have an obligation. So those are not accumulated. Make sense. So in that case, you then raise the provision. For other circumstances, you don't. 
विचार करने में तो वो वो क्लब अकाउंट एंड व्हाट दे डू दे स्पीक टू एच आर व्हेन यू इंप्लॉय समवन दैट पर्सन फ्रॉम द चैट दे इंप्लॉय टू दे इंप्लॉय इन द बिल ऑफ दे Stop sending for your benefits. Uh, not much of progress. I think equally benefit comes. The last time I checked, they, I sent him there by came with more than 15 months. And specifically, the question for you is for short term. I don't talk about it. Other long term, I said, don't worry about it. The first way benefits, the defined benefits, don't worry about it. Defined contribution. I don't just feel that at all, but I was saying it's a contribution. Because there is a contribution expense for the best application. So there is really nothing to say. Now, the decision, the decision not to test the fund benefit plan. What they happen this year. Which means if you go back to pass the benefit, you're gonna see it. Okay, don't waste your time for the future. Right. So you can see up to your uh, to your losses or to your gains, no one of those no make decisions. If you did your undergrad, 20 days you going back, you will remember the quality approach. That's from both of these now. Okay, the ten percent don't know what I'm talking about. Great one. <laughs> <laughs> right. So ten nations did it. That's uh, now this one. Yeah. Oh. Okay, that's part of the defined benefit now. Now, for your termination benefits, termination benefits, I need to give you a warning. Based on the title, the last time this was examined for the STC was uh, January 2018 paper. So, if you go to the ITC, that's a good paper to buy your termination benefits. Now, when they bring termination benefits, they like to bring it with uh, restructuring from engine, which means it normally comes from a map paper, then somehow end up in a deal. So when those restructuring are happening in uh, individual we then fit in the restructuring from an ISS of the project. But the moment you restructure an entity, you need to lay off some people. Those people who are being laid off are discrimination. I said, screw you. That's how normally get it back. Now, for termination benefits, one very simple thing is you, when we started talking about employee benefits, we say the idea is about Recognizing 
matching the expenditure to when the transaction is happening. So for all the other employee benefits, it was about providing the service. So we also account for the expenditure when the service is been. But for termination service, which is being provided, they are being terminated. So for termination benefits, we stop talking about the transaction being a service, but rather we look at it from the highest level. So we look for what causes the event which is so That one state, I cannot say it's this one. So the difference between that. So my advice to you is remember, remember this unfortunate. When you talk about obligating, you talk about the obligation, 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 you talk You've got a uh, traffic run here. You can't afford to pay all the information here. So you start by saying, you know, that guy's working and stuff like that. The people start working someone from 8 to 10 or someone from 10 to 12. Until you get to a point where you're like, let's trust the people so that they can see. <laughs> So we trust the people. <laughs> now the idea is the accountant understands that there is a voluntary termination and there's a forced termination. Voluntary is you're coming and say, okay, no, okay. <laughs> Now you come and say, I'm like, that's cool. I don't own you anything except for your salary too. There. But if I terminate you, then you didn't want to be. Now I'm forced to pay you for terminating you. Know, so the first thing is to force you to go to work. Then if that doesn't happen, then you need to be fired. So the thing now is the standard separates those two types of termination. Look at there's a voluntary one and there is a forced one. I need us to jump to I think you want to see what is the one to buy. There we go. Actually, let's start at one fifty nine because that's where this whole thing all still starts. All right, so, uh, this thing. Okay, please don't use this thing. It's not quite. Look at that one. Or look at your standard. So, 59 talks about the standard deals with, yeah, we know it deals with termination benefits. 160, termination benefits do not include employee benefits resulting from termination of employment at the request of the employee without an entity's offer or as a result of mandatory retirement requirements because those benefits are post-employment benefits. So some entities provide a lower level of benefit for termination of employment at the request of the employee in substance of post-employment benefits than for termination of employment at the request of the entity. The difference between the benefit provided for termination of employment at the request of the employee and the higher benefit provided at the request of the entity is a termination benefit. So what this paragraph is bringing is 
When you come on your own and you say, guys, I'm leaving, there is no termination cost to talk about. It's you who wants to go. So normally it doesn't create any form of a present obligation, which means there's no liability or provision that you need to raise. Then 161, let's some power. Right, so 161 and 162 focuses much on is this really a termination or is it an exchange for services which has been provided? So the form of the employee benefit does not determine whether it is provided in exchange for services or in exchange for termination of the employee's employment. Termination benefits are typically lump sum payment, but sometimes can also include enhancements of post employment benefits, either indirectly through an employment benefit plan or Directly, salary until the end of a specified notice period if the employee renters no further service that provides economic benefits to the entity. But the trigger should be this benefit is arising because we want to terminate. If it's not coming as a result of our, of our, of our mission is to terminate you, then it's not a termination benefit. Then 162 gives you the indicators that you need to look at. Um, now I want to jump to recognition on 165. So 165 says, an entity shall recognize a liability and an expense for termination benefits at the earlier of the following days. The earlier of the two. Number one, when the entity can no longer withdraw the offer of those benefits. And when the entity recognizes costs for a restructuring that is within the scope of ISTED service and involves the payment of termination <laughs> benefits. Now, if you remember well, just remember the provisions of ISTED 7 on restructuring. When does a restructuring obligation all right. What is the obligating way? So it talks about restructuring. Restructuring starts in the boardroom. You put it down and some guy says, okay, what do you do? I think we need to do this. Some other guy says, yeah, I think of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the boardroom, this is good. Or two, four, 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 five. Great. Let's turn it. The decision is being made. Just a few minutes of a minute. Now, does that create? No. Because we can wake up tomorrow and be like, I thought it was a mistake. You don't care. What is going on today? There's no obligation. <coughs> now, after the minutes uh, come up, and then Somehow they link to the employee. And the employees now know that the restructuring takes place and people are going to get it. So, what do you think it's true? So, I don't want to hold you anything. I don't want to hold anyone anything. Because no one can come and say, look at that. Normally, we look for when there's communication that 
Benefits, but I'm running out of time. It's, uh, we're already one hour into this one. Okay. I want to jump to I'm going to talk about this now. Okay. Any, any question when I say nah, that's, that's great. <laughs> Number two, 
if it's a good level, you are guaranteed that one of the subsidiaries in that group is a foreign operation. <laughs> 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 Number three, if the subsidiary is a foreign operation, you are guaranteed that even if it are fired or disposed in the current year, you know, the past is a foreign operation. Four, which means as I'm concerned, as I'm studying my technical system, all good to know the application should be done. But if I have not yet started my cash flows, I have not started foreign operation cash flows or level foreign operation and I have not started with the source of the basis, I have not yet started So, if you from your block, I know you cover this.
operating this in the corner. Great. Get a figure, put direct cost, then boom, I've got my right to this asset. So day one, they be right of this asset, credit this liability, credit any other payments that I've done. If you want to copy, you have to share. Agree. 
Well, you can, can be you can be nightmare if you don't have that resistance to try to cover the the adjustment. But once you look at um, an upper visual pain, what is the amount? Since moves with average, and then I put the rate at the beginning of the year, you find the MCTR at the end of five period, and then I throw in the current period moving with an average rate, and then I sum this everything, I put the close rate, close rate, and then I look at the difference that I use with the MCTR for the current period. So for me to separate the MCTR, we should be sitting as open as balance. So the additional MCTR I want to come through as a movement in the current year. I actually need that analysis. But now, <clears throat> you need to know whether you need to use that information or not before you start doing it. <laughs> because um, if you remember from, from your prior studies, that analysis can check a while. <laughs> and um, I'm sure from all the questions that you've done today, you've never seen a required to prepare the analysis of equity. Presentation one mark. You never get that. <laughs> so that's not part of the required. If you give that, you've not answered the required. So you don't get nothing. So you need to be quite clear what is to do. I really need this information before I bring it here. Now for cash flow statements. 95% of the time you don't need that analysis. You only need that analysis a disposal of a foreign operation. Well, you now need the full FCT. But even if you, you, you want to do that, there's still, there's still an easy way to do that. Now, what I want to start with is your exam technique for cash flow says when you look at, can I erase this? Thank you. Right. One of the things that Leonard talked about during the block was you've got your operating activities, this thing does not work. Well, <laughs> operating activities, then you've got what? Investing activities, then you've got financing activities. And yeah, that's when you adjust your profit, blah, 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 blah. blah. But you've got things that should come directly here, such as your, your tax, <laughs> your dividend, <laughs> and your interest. Under your investing here, it's normally quite simple. What investments do you like? So normally your financial instruments, your normal non-current assets, uh, as well as your uh, your subsidiaries and associates, agreed. Okay, acquisition and disposal. Okay. Financing activities, uh, sorry. Yes, financing activities. This one type of work. Yeah. Now, am I right if I say here we are actually talking about the capital component? So if you obtain a loan or you repay a loan, that's what I'm talking about. Now, Let's go back to the example that I talked about on uh, leases. You said for leases, what you would do is, under your operating activities here, you start with PVT. You take that figure and you'll be like, let's adjust for non-cash uh, non items. And you say there is depreciation. For the right of use asset. There's also depreciation for other assets, agreed? You say there might be payment there, great. You also say there is finance cost related to the interest, am I right? So you move this non cash. And 
from the right of his asset side, there is no cash movement at all. Agree? Mm -hmm. But from the liability side, you then say the movement is not finance cost, the movement is actually the coupon. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, when you bring the coupon here, where does it go? Ada, here. Now, do you still remember your amortization table? When you need to go to your calculator and you say amort, it shows you how many columns. It shows you the PMT column. What else? It shows you the finance or the interest column. What else? The capital column. Then the balance. So your coupon payment comprises of what and what? I hope that's water. I didn't say anything more. <laughs> right, so. Oh, it's, it's the system. Okay. Is it me? <laughs> okay, I don't know you say the coupon comprises of what? Okay. So would I be correct to say if you load your coupon payment here? That's incorrect. You need to separate because you see this represents the capital coupon. You need to separate your coupon and bring the interest that side and the capital coupon. <coughs> <laughs> I'm not going to try <laughs> Okay. Did you get that right? So please don't, let's not make that mistake. Now, on the practice questions that you, you do, you may find a question which is logic, a full copy down there. But what you need to be careful on is remember there are also accounting policies for payment. Where an entity can specifically say our policy is below our fine, our interest down here. That's the only time you are allowed to load the program when you see that policy. Without that policy, you need to separate. Okay, happiness. Number two, you talked about every time that you do, you now come here, now looking for the cash movement there. You always need to do a T account. Agreed? Now, that T account, let's take a T account for PP. So, a T account for PPE. Is like uh, okay. this thing is going to damage your ears. Can I take this off? Now, voice project. Can you hear me? <laughs> Are you good? Sit the back. Can you still hear me? You can. Uh, <laughs> oh, the only guy can hear me as well. Ah, this so this thing is making noise. Okay. Uh, oh, great. See now, critical thinking. <laughs> All right. Can you hear me now? <laughs> I feel like a pop something. 
zero percent that every T account that you have has been perfect. So your line item on the cash flow statement is under the written Whether it's PPE addition or it's PPE disposal, that's your line. But what you need to make sure you have done is you say PPE acquisition. If your T account is working number nine, then to reference this is working number one, working number nine. So that the examiner goes and marks working number nine. From my experience, from the line items that we have on your case of session, all of them are going to be wrong. <laughs> no figures can affect us on the on the on the margin. That doesn't matter. What gets marked is how did you get there? Okay. So reference, put your T account in reference to that. Now what we do is your cash flow statement is got 60 easy marks. Uh, 60 percent, sorry, 60 percent easy marks. Those easy marks are for open balance, work balance, and then you put the adjustments there. So by the virtue of you going to the balances, and you say, did you see that there is an opening balance there? Uh, balance opening and then another balance closing there. You get half here, half here. Now half may seem like it's not a lot. But half for 15 T accounts. That's one mark, one mark, one mark. Opening and closing. For 15 T accounts, you've got 50 marks. For simply putting one sitting in the TV. So do you realize that some people actually get away with that. They simply be like, oh, it's a case of statement, so what I'm going to do is I'll look for everything. Uh, text, working one, opening, closing. <laughs> Next. <laughs> so Then the next thing is, remember that when you are working with group financial statements, your group financial statements is consolidated the line items of the parent and the line items for the subsidiary. So if the subsidiary was acquired during the year, that means your opening balance 
is only for the parent. But your closing is for both the parent and the subscription. So you then put the two ways to do that. You can put all the balances here, or you can put <coughs> P plus S, then you put the together. Okay. But always watch out for when was the acquisition or disposal of the subsidy. Number two. Number two. When we have acquired the subsidiary, we have acquired a company, which means the company comes with all its assets and all its liability. Now, one thing that you need to watch out for is paragraph 18 of IFS 3, which says what you see in the subsidiary day and acquisition date may not necessarily be what's sitting in the group, because the acquisition date all assets acquired and liabilities assumed should be at same So what then happens is you will be given the books of the subsidiary and there will be a PP there which is not at paper. So when you come and do your T account here, you're going to say this is the balance that is up. This balance moved from here to there because of a number of things. The first thing is this balance increase because we acquired a subsidiary which brought in its own KPP. But the value that I'm going to put here is not the value that you see in the child balance of the subsidiary. Because in the consolidated, it came at fair value. So you bring the fair value figure. That's a separate concept in this one. Then, after that, you then say, but the challenge is <coughs> this figure that I'm bringing here is for a foreign subsidiary, which means I'm giving that figure in euro. I'm reporting in dollars. So I need to translate that figure in euro to dollars at a certain rate. You've got spotted acquisition things. We have average for the period we have closing balance, closing, closing rate. So the next concept is for knowing the correct rate to use when you bring that asset to And that one should be at which rate? Spotted acquisition date. So does this time item on its own can have three months? One for knowing that we add subsidy balance which get through. The second knowing that it should be fair value. The third one using the correct rate three months one. Then from there the next thing is <coughs> under my PPE I also understand that when you go to the PPE note the balance on the PPE note is the one which corresponds to the PPE that will be sitting at the face of my financial statement. That's all. That PPE note comprises of how many cents? I have 16. Okay, 36. Yeah, there will be. Will 40 be there? <laughs> Forty will not be in there. What else? Thirty-eight. Thirty-eight will not be there. I have one. We do need one more. Okay. So, uh, right. So, I've got a question for you. When you've got a right of use asset, which has got you. It goes to BBD. Yeah. So you need to watch out for that. Look at your TB. Does your TB separate PP line item and right of use asset? Or does your PPE simply say PPE? Then under additional information for PPE, you then start seeing right of uh, leases down there. 
Thanks. Which means if there's a new list which has been entered into during the year, you can see that this is part of the addition. So we then bring our right off. Previously, before we introduced our choice of entry, you'd see a line item which would say finance list. Okay. So that could be part of the additions, which means these are non-cash. We want to separate all the non so that the balance in the class we can use. Then we also have good movements which reduce the value of the PPE, which would be your depreciation, your disposals, your impairment for the Depreciation, taking note that the other depreciation is right of this. Okay. Now, there's something which is missing. What is it? One element. Yes. You can have a reclassification from I have 16 to I have 5. We import a non current asset which has been, which is now being held for sale. So there's now a change in the manner of recovery. Which affects you here. So you've got assets which have been transferred to I have 5. So do you see what I mean when I'm saying it has got nothing to do with I have 7? <laughs> Now, we will now need to bring in the contents of IFS file. At what value do you transfer the PPE to IFS file? The carrying amount at the date of reclassification, you still remember. So that means you actually need to go and take the opening balance, depreciate it, repay it to the date of when it gets reclassified. <coughs> But sometimes what can also happen is you may have assets which were previously held for sale, but then they're no longer held for sale. So they get reclassified back to I-16. But here's the thing, no one will tell you that the asset has been reclassified. You need to figure it on your own that there is an asset which has been reclassified here. Now for example, let's say that you've got an entity which says the, due to the um, current economic, uh, the, the, the difficult economic environment which we are operating in, it's no longer sustainable to keep operating in Zimbabwe. Therefore, the strategy of the entity is now to relocate to Botswana. So what they do is they identify all the assets which they need to move with to Botswana. Those which they don't move with, they then say these ones we are now holding them for. So they do an active step to locate it via the advertise, the decision to dispose, signed by the board of directors, which means it passes all the requirements of IFRS 5, paragraph 5 to 7. Then, by the time you get to a reporting date, which is 31 December, they then told that the economy is now improved. <laughs> And the board is now certain that they don't have to go to Botswana anymore. So the strategy is changed. They're no longer relocating since the economy is good. That's all they would have said under the background of the entity on page one. <laughs> Based on that, you need to know that the classification of the asset as the old for sale was because we wanted to move to Botswana. Since we are no longer moving to Botswana, what does it mean? We are not selling. So those are some of the things which, um, when you get your your exam feedback and they'll be like, uh, candidates led to critical thinking, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> okay, now, here's the thing. What I want you to talk about is, this is not what I want. What I'm worried about is, 
your interpolation of choice. You said here the subsidiary brought in PPE at acquisition rate, the rate which was made acquisition rate. That same subsidiary is going to consolidate it at the end of the year. So the same PPE is going to be sitting in the balance sheet of the group at the end of the year. Converted from euro, translated to euro to dollars at what rate? But it can go into the account at this rate, which is not the rate you have in close. So how did this asset move from this rate to that rate? Ah, not exactly. It got depreciated, and this depreciation is sitting in the P and L in what rate? The average. So you've got this asset which came in this rate. It got depreciated at another depreciated at another rate. It's not sitting at the close with another rate. But three different rates for the same asset. So when you then add this minus this is equal to this, it will not balance. Agree. The balancing figure is what? The balancing figure becomes FCTR. I don't know which side it goes to. It can be either side. Make sense? Yeah. Are you with me? Yes. Now, here's the thing. This is an example of one account. <laughs> <laughs> For every line that you have in the balance of the subsidiary, this has to happen. Using your analysis of equity, it's a contribution of FCTR as coming from a number of accounts. Which means when I'm now doing a T account for each account, that account is contributing to all FCTR. Therefore, if it's a case flow statement, if you find yourself calculating F doing the analysis so that you can get the FCTR figure, you're wasting a lot of time because you're going to get one lump sum figure of FCTR which is useless. You don't want the FCTR for the whole thing. You want FCTR at each account level. So that you can determine now, therefore, if this is the case, whatever balancing figure which is there is now the case. If you don't do that, then you've got an FCTR sitting at the balancing figure which distorts your cash flow. So the FCTR is not cash flow. <laughs> All right, so I'll go through this again slowly. <laughs> so I said when you when you are consolidating a subsidiary which has been acquired, you're gonna bring through the assets which have been acquired and the liabilities which has been assumed. When you do that, you bring them through at the acquisition date exchange. But that asset does not win in that figure until the closing rate. That amount shifts in value. So it can shift by depreciation, it can shift by impairment. In euro, that's when they are bringing these figures. So when you consolidate, you can say, I'm taking over at this rate, I am going to include the depreciation which is coming from those European accounts and the impairment which is coming from those European accounts. But these are sitting in the PNK also they come at average rate. Then at the end of the day, when I'm not consolidating that balance sheet, the whole balance sheet is going to be sitting at closing rate at the deposit rate. So when I look at that PP came in at one rate, got depreciated at another rate, and then it closed. Which means if we draw everything else, this foreign PPE does not balance itself. And the reason for that is because that PPE also has got a translation which took place at different rates, which creates an exchange gain or loss. But that exchange gain or loss is because we are translating from one functional currency to another presentation currency. 
So the exchange gain loss does not sit in the penny of a drug that goes to a CTR account. So with PPE, since this PPE, there's foreign PPE here, that foreign PPE has got its own contribution of the CTR. But now, you need to watch out. You may also have the subsidiary having acquired the PPE from another country. Which, which brings in the element of IS21. You still remember IS21 is broken into, into two. Foreign transactions and foreign operations. If the subsidiary transacted in another currency which is not their functional, that also means that a foreign transaction which could have resulted in an exchange gain or loss. That exchange gain or loss, <coughs> by the time you go to the reporting period, it had been settled. If it was not settled as yet, that means it's sitting as part of your PL line items. So you remove it as part of your non cash movement. But if it has been paid off, then that means it is translated from non cash into <coughs> cash. So you don't need to adjust it under non cash. So you still remember that whole thing about the exchange gains or losses which go to the PL. They only arise on monetary items. You still remember. Mm -hmm. You're not monetary, you don't have issues. So here you will never have an exchange gain or loss sitting in the PNL. Well, this is non monetary. But when you go to the loan account or the liability account, that one can have an exchange gain or loss, which is sitting in the PNL. As long as that liability is a foreign liability, that means with passage of time, there's also an exchange gain on those which is taking place. Okay. Are we are we are we together? Like, everyone is with me. No one lost. Okay, great. So like I said, I'm just talking about the key result. Uh let me just check how we're we doing on terms of time. We've got 30 minutes to go. So Maybe let me let me move to the last section. When you look at your investing activities, you say if there's an acquisition of a subsidiary or a disposal of a subsidiary, it also forms an investing activity. So there is a cash flow which is there, or a cash outflow, inflow outflow which is there. Now my question. How do you find the cash inflow or outflow? What do you think? You want me to repeat the question? Okay, I say when you have got a, a subsidiary which has been acquired, you paid to get that subsidiary. Agreed? So there is a cash outflow. Now, how do you get the figure that you put on the face of the cash flow? What do you take? Huh? Yes, Ravi. Uh huh. Thank you. So the idea is, as you as you pay to acquire that subsidiary, that cap subsidiary was functioning. So it had a bank account. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, legal what? Uh, it's, a, it's a legal entity. It's a legal facility. So it has got its own bank account. It's got its own cash book. So when you acquire, you acquire including the cash balances, which means my total cash outflow is not really what I paid. What I paid less what I. What I received. But here's the thing. At undergrad level, what they'll simply do is subsidiary was acquired for three million. Done. Then there was um, half a million sitting in as part of the bank balances of the subsidiary. So you cash out for then take the three million less the half a million there, you can like two point five. That's my cash movement. Out there. Put it on the face of the financial uh, the cash flow. At this level, obviously they're not gonna do that. What they will do is subsidiaries acquired for three million, which was 
paid in the full manner. Half a million paid in cash today. I no 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 no. You only say paid in cash today. Half a million payable in two years time. <laughs> then another five hundred thousand payable if the revenue gets to reach uh, ninety percent of something. Then in the process they are also going to give their own building away. To the guys, and then the remaining amount will be in cash, which means now you now need to take the three million. In the three million, like there's a contingent, like uh, there's a contingent liability which is sitting in there. There's a deferred payment which is sitting in there. There is a PPE, non-cash, which is sitting in there. But the PPE, I don't take the cash amount, but rather I take the fair value of the PPE. Still remember that. So that I eliminate the item so that I only remain with the, the cash element. Once I get the cash element, then I'll be like, do you have any cash in the subsidiary acquisition date? Less that. Then that becomes my cash movement in the cash. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there a cash movement? As long as there is no cash movement, it's not not part of the cash flow. Now the the most number of marks are not on calculating that cash movement. Calculating that cash movement is probably like something like five marks. The majority of the marks are on the disclosure. Remember, you can then get it for every disposal or acquisition which is there, they then say uh, put the related disclosures. Now those disclosures are very simple. And I don't want anyone to ever forget them. So here's the thing. Can I give you a trick on how to remember those disclosures? They are there in the standard. So if you read the standard, you should be able to figure it out. That's the trick. <laughs> right. So let's say you've acquired you've acquired this subsidiary. Then they say, present the related cash flow disclosures related to the subsidiary which has been acquired. What they mean there is, when we look at what you're saying, this is the consideration you pay. This is what we see there when you look at the cash outflow. It's not, it's not matching. So what is the problem? Reconcile the two. That's what they're saying. Okay. So here's what you do. If it's an acquisition of a subsidiary, let's write down the goodwill formula. How do you calculate goodwill? On a piece of paper, write down the goodwill formula. Good work. Been easy. You are flipping the standard at this point. <laughs> In trouble. Right. Should be done by now. So the good formula says uh, purchase consideration plus NCI less the fair value of identified bonnet assets. That gives you a good work. Now, make purchase consideration the subject of the formula. The 
this one should be easy as well. That's like completely mad. Make patient's consideration the subject of the formula. Okay, after doing that, you now have a uh, value of identify bonnet passes plus good wall, less NCI, that will give you purchase consideration. Now, that way that you've written it, that's your disclosure. That is exactly this project. Yeah, that's what you've written. <laughs> they say right in the school. That's what you did. So the only difference is where you say hey, value of identify bonnet assets, you list the net assets. So you list all the assets and all the liabilities which have been assumed. Then you remove the NCI. You add the goodwill, sorry, I forgot that. You add the goodwill, you put all the assets, you remove the NCI. That will give you the purchase consideration. But the problem is that purchase consideration is not what sitting in the cash flow statement, agreed. So for them to match, what do I need to do? I need to, I need to remove the cash flow bank which is up there under the net asset. Then it will make it what's sitting in the cash flow. Done. That's all. So you put your good flow, you put your PP acquired, the intangible assets, um, right of use assets, uh, inventory acquired, then you put your liabilities, all of your liabilities there, then list my NCI. I get my purchase consideration, less the cash which is up there, then to match with the cash which is sitting in the cash flow there. All right. If it doesn't balance, leave it like that. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. So half of the time what happens is we end up looking for half a month to make that thing balance. It will take us something like six weeks to get half a month. Okay, leave it. Go and get more months somewhere else. Right, so is, is the disclosure for acquired subsidiaries clear? Yeah. If you dispose a subsidiary and they say prepare the disclosure related to the cash flows of the disposed subsidiary, is there again? Let's put the journal entry for disposal. How do you calculate the gain on disposal? Which which paragraph is it? B nine C. Let's put it down. So it's so easy. What you just need to know is what am I trying to do? That's all. The moment you figure out what I'm trying to do, then everything makes sense. Right. Um, guess you know if you've been at a tonight, which is credit what? Credit coordinate passes, debit. 
David NCI. David again what? David process. Then David operated what? Okay. So you can you can have a debit of the remaining the remaining interest in the subsidiary. Then from there you balance off, correct? To gain the to get the gain or loss on disposal. Now again, make the purchase consideration the subject of the formula. Okay. So at the moment you should have uh, the net assets less NCI less the, uh, the fair value of the remaining less the gain on disposal. Uh, it or less the gain or loss on disposal. Remember the gain or loss on disposal. Um, there will be two two areas there. On the remaining remaining uh, amount, let's say you are left with an assortment. What are you doing? the remaining interest do you what do you do with the remaining interest does, does it also form part of the gain or loss hmm? remember that you created net assets at book value you debited the remaining interest not at book value but at fair value so the component relating to the remaining interest is what its own adjustment. You agree with that? So that adjustment is what? Not a gain or loss of this point. Because you have not disposed the remaining interest. Agree. It's a, it's a fair adjustment. 
That favor adjustment will be sitting in the PNL as an annotation. So it forms part of the adjustment there on your, on your operating activities. It's exactly the same concept with when we've got a step up position, paragraph 41 to 43, where you say you take the value of the previously held based on whatever the way it was calculated, but it's the kidding amount. That kidding amount cannot be the assumed consideration. It's just that you first need to fair value it, you still remember that. Which means when I've got a step up position, I also have a non-cash movement sitting in my PNL that I need to adjust. So I'm saying here, you want to make your purchase consideration the subject of your program. So I said you got your net assets, less your NCI, less your fair value of the uh, remaining interest, less the if there's a loss, fair value loss on the remaining interest, or edge if there is a gain on the remaining interest, fair value of the remaining interest. Then you also have the gain or loss on disposal, which you are removing if it's a loss and you're adding it it's a gain. That will then give you the purchase consideration. Now, when you now have that, the next thing is it's not matching with what's sitting in the cash flow. You then adjust for any cash or bank which has been lost at point of disposal, which are sitting in the subsidy. Which means the disclosure now, where you say net assets, you are not saying net assets into put a figure. You list the net assets. The net assets are PPE, building, inventory, cash, then got liabilities there, creditors, loans, debentures. You list everything. So do you see where the maths come from? By listing all those net assets one by one, you're getting half mark, half mark, half mark, half mark, half mark. Which means the more they put, the more you're signing. Okay. So your disposal, um, so your, your disclosure should never give you headaches. You forget that's always what you can do. Make the purchase consideration the subject of the formula in your whole page. Okay. One last thing is watch out for financial instruments. So financial instruments are terrible because your your financial instruments have got uh, those funny rules for classification of financial assets. Now, for a cash flow question, what they'll do is they will not uh, they'll probably not give you the the classification. They'll give you the business models for each instrument. Then they expect you to pick that from each model which is there, this would be the impact to the financial statement. Therefore, I've got a non-cash movement which has gone there and there and there. So the first stage is to look at, is this an amortized cost? If it's an amortized cost, I've got a finance cost sitting there. Or maybe it's a fair value through OCI based on the business model, which means I still have a finance cost which is sitting in the PL, but I also have a Fair value movement sitting in the OCI. Now, my profit before tax is not affected by the <coughs> fair value movement, but it's affected by the finance cost side, the amortization one. I need to make that adjustment. But when I go now under my financing activities, the whole movement was non cash. I need to replace it with the actual coupon payment. That coupon payment has got two things which have been paid for, like I've discussed before. Then separated the finance versus the capital company. <coughs> but the, the one thing that we often miss is if you do not understand the relationship between your financial instrument and the impairment model, then you're in trouble. 
because you can end up going to adjust the payment in the T account for the, the, the asset. It may be it was not affecting the asset. So, the journal entry for an impairment of um, an impairment for a fair value through OCI and an amortized cost would it be the same? Let's start with fair value through PNL. Do we, do we impair? If it's an amortized cost, what will be our impairment journal entry? What does it look like? Debit impairment loss, failure. Huh? Credit loss. The ECO allowance. Yeah. Now, when your financial statements are presented, does the ECO allowance sit on its own, or it's presented already in the in the in the in the, in the balance of the instrument? So you need to be careful on that. Don't go with the rule there. Analyze the information which you've been given. Because if you've been given a trial balance, it will be sitting independent on its own. Because it's a ledger account. It's the same concept if you accumulated depreciation, you will see the cost sitting there, the accumulated depreciation sitting there. So analyze the information that you've been given and understand what is the impact. <coughs> If you go with the rule and be like, it was accounted like this on another practice question that I did, things can change. <clears throat> but now there's a difference between any, any impairment that uh, we are raising and a credit impaired asset. Now at some point you, you may need to actually write of certain uh, receivables, agreed. But the whole thing about expected credit loss is we don't want the loss to hit the PNL in the year in which this guy is declared insolvent. Because the troubles did not begin this year, the troubles began prior. So we raise our ECL, ECL. In those years, PNL, 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 so that in the year in which you default, what we do is we actually reverse the impact, the receivable, by taking it from the allowance. So there's no PNL unless if the allowance is not enough. Agreed. Now I'm saying this because if you then use a practice question, which is uh, pre-2017, you get two different concepts. Pre-2017, we were not using expected credit loss model. We were using incurred loss model, you still remember. I said in IT. Which means you see the loss hitting the PNL at point of writing off. Which can give you the wrong concepts when you're applying IFS line. So for the standards which have changed, IFRS 15, IFRS 16, and IFRS 9, please be careful with the type of questions that you use. Your IFRS 15, I think that one is uh, a little bit easier and straightforward. But for IFRS 15, remember your revenue is not always cash. Okay, you can have revenue which is not yet received. But I think, um, <coughs> Those extra, outside the fact that those extras that we talked about, the warranties, the sales of right of return, uh, the uh, purchase with the uh, sell with an option to retain, you still remember those things. Okay. Let's also be careful of those, those things. If you are also using 2017, practice questions going back, you see that they will have hedging. Hedging has been swapped out. So please don't 
at your head trying to figure out what is happening. However, please don't don't mix up aging concepts with April 22 concepts. April 22 is not aging. <laughs> so when you go the prepaid uh, asset which has been bought in a foreign currency, then your April 22 applies, and it locks the costs at the date at which you committed to the transaction. But because um, because you have uh, you you have prepaid, there is nothing which is which is being adjusted subsequent to that. There are no exchange exchange gains or loss. But if it's a transaction which is not settled, which means you are sitting with a liability. That liability then shifts to go to ISP one as a monetary asset. That's when you then have exchange rate of losses. So let's also be particular when it comes to your epic uh, twenty two. So I think those are the sections uh, which I wanted to highlight as far as cash flows are concerned. I think those were the most key uh, for me. Your your efforts too. And um, how is how is that going? Because so your efforts too. Yeah, we're gonna examine that. Um, for practice. Uh, there's a good IFS2 question in the January 2018 ITC paper. There's a good IFS2 question then. It's a super, it's a lovely one. 2018, January 2018. Now, like, I, like what Leonard emphasized during your blog session, remember that for your IFS2, the major, major, the most important part is at group level. At group level. Huh? You didn't have a group. Okay, that's good. Cool. It's in the start. It's part of <laughs> You just need to go to, you go to, part, you go to, if it's to paragraph 43. When you go to 43, up, please, there is, there is 43, then there's 43A, 43B. I'm not talking about 43A, I'm talking about 43. Then 43 has got A, B, and C. Not 43A, 43 only. Then that 43 has got A, B, and C. If you're opening the standard, you will get to what I'm talking about. Cool. Yeah. I don't know but the 43 one, yes, but it's all APS. Okay, then it's paragraph 43, A, B, C. Then there is paragraph 43, A. I'm not talking about this, I'm talking about this. Now, from paragraph 1 to paragraph 42, yeah, you're learning about the different types of uh, cash, uh, of shared base payments. At 43, that couldn't really test you how, how much you know. So remember that your shared base payments are split into two types. Either cash sales or Equity set. For your case set of what do you do? How do you measure? Okay, yeah, but you add a reporting date. If it's um, equity set, you add prevalent at one date. At the date of settlement, what do you do? The date of settlement. Um, yes, the equity one. What journal entries do you raise? The date of settlement. David? Huh? The reserve. They remove the reserve. 
or else you do credit mm. okay now let's let's start with this is it okay if I say it depends with the men of settlement there are two there are two types of settlement you might be excess or you might be profit. Good. If you are exercising, then that means you're not getting your shares. Agreed. If you're forfeiting, you're losing everything. So I just want to hammer on this concept. If you're exercising, it depends on what was the nature of your agreement. You can enter into a um, an option to purchase. If you're given options to purchase, they're not giving you shares. That's correct. <coughs> they're giving you an option to purchase at a certain excise price. Which means further to what we have done. On the day of exercising, for you to get the shares, you need to pay. So on that day, <coughs> what becomes the value or the consideration? For the shares that you're getting, if you are leaving for you. What becomes the consideration? The excise price plus plus the value of the services that you have provided during the vesting period. Okay. Which means now your journal entry is simply. Think of it from a cash perspective. If you were buying the shares for cash, what would be your journal entry? As an employee, if you're buying, you'd be like credit bank, debit investment, agreed. But here you are counting from both sides, the employer side. So from the employer side, you're actually selling or issuing shares. So that means credit shake up, debit what? Bank. But the thing now is, this guy is paying in two forms. Paying in the form of what they have worked for, the services, which I have been putting in the reserve. So that means your payment is a debit of the excess price which I have received, debit bank, plus a debit of the reserve which is representing the services. Then for the guy who was forfeited, you would wait for these shares, which means there's value which is sitting in the reserve. You decide to donate that money to me by not for it. What does it become to you as an entity? Yes, it is income, but when what? Going to retain earnings. Now, let's not forget the principle here. Don't ever reverse the employee benefit cost that you raised in the prior years. Because the communication you'll be sending, if you get, if you credit employee benefit, you're saying it was a prior period error. So please let's not make that mistake. Because your the people that are the examiner when they're making your script, they interpret the communication that you're sending through your journal. If it's sending the wrong message, you don't get much. So effectively, my return earnings is still going to go down even if you put it in the PNL because it's close the PNL to your return earnings. But the concept is wrong because you say it's, a, it's an error which was made. They were supposed to remove those employee benefits. And number two, your PNL, remember, represents trade. When the guy was providing sales, that was related to trade. When the guy forfeits, that has got nothing to do with trade. Agreed. So at the point at which you are holding option to acquire shares, we are now regarding you as a potential shareholder who has got an option to buy. We decide to forfeit and donate that option back to us. That's now a transaction between Shareholders, it should sit in the same location as the equity and stop there. Nothing else. Now, 
we have got certain situations where you cancel. You talked about cancellations, right? Now, uh, at point of cancellation, be careful of incentives. When I'm cancelling, I'm now saying what we agreed initially, uh, reverse this. But here's the thing. If you promise me five dollars worth of shares, and you come back to me today and say, look, my friend, I'll give you the five dollars in cash. I don't want the cash. I want the shares because the shares were appreciated by the value. So I don't want the cash. So what employers do is to motivate employees to buy into the cancellation. They cannot pay a favor. They need to go above favor for the other guy to agree to the cancellation. So 90% of the time that you're going to see a cancellation, the payment for that cancellation is not going to be favored. So if it's a discussion question, you need to, even if it's a calculation question, you need to pay special attention to the difference between the fair value and what has been paid. The top up, well, that's an incentive. Now that's an incentive that say pure loss to the entity. So that becomes a pain in our eyes. I'm sure you know where it's coming from in the standard, I agree? Okay, yes. But I wanted to focus more on the reasons behind it, the situation we create that. All right. So we need to we need to uh, uh, to be careful when it comes to it. Now I was talking about groups. When you go to forty three A talks about um, that introduces the group thing. Then B looks at from the perspective of um, can you confirm for me is it the issuer or the receiver? B is B the one receiving the benefit? Just confirm for me. The one uh, the one who's settling. The one who's settling, okay. A is, A is what? So A is the entity setting. Oh, okay. B? Okay. C? Can I can I borrow? <laughs> we are reading at the wrong thing. <laughs> okay, okay, no, you are, you are, you are the correct one. Uh, so, no, 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 sorry, right, I want you to look at the other one, not, I give you that one, uh, my apologies, I want you to look at the one with 43 capital A. Yes. <laughs> Capital A, yes. You had highlighted your book. Um, why would you highlight it? <laughs> okay. Now, I I want you to look at what 43, 43A is got subsection A and subsection B. So it says here, for share based payment transactions among group entities, in each separate or individual financial statements, the entry to receiving the goods or service shall measure the goods or service received is either an equity set or a case set of share based payment transaction by assessing the following the nature of the hours granted and its own rights and obligations. The amount recognized by the entry to receiving the goods or service may differ from the amount recognized by the consolidated group or another group entity. That's why I'm saying 43A is <coughs> just setting the foundation, the groundwork. Doesn't say much. 43 B and C are your keywords. So 43 B says the entity receiving, or 43 says the entity settling. So each time you need to identify which entity are you representing. If you are representing the entity which is receiving, go to 43 B. If you are representing the entity which is settling, go to 43 C. If you are representing both, come on. So 43 B says the entity receiving, the goods or services, which is the entity which has got the employee who's receiving the awards, shall measure the goods or services received as an equity set of share-based payments when 
either number one, the awards granted are its own equity instrument, which is obvious. If you can pay using your own equity instrument, then you pay its equity settled. Or number two, the entity's got no obligations, which means if someone else is settling on your behalf, to you it's equity settled. Then B, let's look at the guy who's settling. So the entity settling share based payments transaction when another entity in the group receives or the goods or services. So you are settling, but you're not the one who's receiving the goods or services. So this normally happens with the parent company being the head of this. So you then issue out a scheme which is for the benefit of the whole group. So you are settling, but the subsidiary is the one which is benefiting. Some shall recognize the transaction as an equity set of share based payment transaction only if it is settled in the entity's own equity instrument. Great, obviously, if I'm going to pay using my own shares equity settled. Otherwise, the transaction shall recognize as a case set of share based payments. So do you realize that in this case, it is quite possible that you can have equity settled for scheme A in the parents' books. You go to the subsidiaries' books, you see another equity reserve again. Two equity reserves for one transaction. Now, the most important part is to understand how to do your pro forma consolidate with general entries when you get this situation. Well, the first thing being what has been done by the parent and what has been done by the subsidiary and what is the correct treatment at group level. Now, let's start with if the parent company says they're going to issue out shares to employees of the subsidiary. What is the journal entry that is processed by the parent company? Let me watch the well. And they're going to settle using their own shares. David investment. They are they're investing in their subsidiary to grow. So David investment credit, equity share based payment to them. You go to the subsidiary. The subsidiary is the one which is receiving the benefit, but they are doing nothing. So what are they going to do? Debit. Debit what? Employee benefit expense. Credit share based payment reserve again. Now, when you go to consolidate, you've got two equity reserves, you've got an investment, and you've got an employee benefit. Which ones are the correct ledgers at group level? So, as a group, do we have an employee benefit cost? Yes. So the employee benefit cost should remain there. It shouldn't go anywhere. Do we have an investment? No. We should reverse the investment. Then we should also reverse one of the equity settled. The reserves agreed. Which one should go out? The subsidiaries. Now the problem or the challenge is normally not with that type of transaction. You normally get um, situations which are difficult when you have got an equity. Um, let's say the, the parent is issued out a scheme to the employees of the subsidiary, but they're going to settle in cash. If they're going to settle in cash, that's the debit investment credit. Credit credit what? Credit liability. Now the subsidiary is going to have debit employee benefit, credit, credit what? They cannot have a liability. To go to 43, if the entity receiving is no obligation to settle, becomes what? Uh, becomes equity. So you've got the parent accounting for the scheme as a liability, but the subsidiary accounting for the scheme as equity which means the parent company is accounting for the scheme at fair value on which date? 
pay value at at the 14 days. The subsidiary is accounting at pay value at 20 days. Now, when you come to do the elimination, you want to remove the investment that side but keep the liabilities. You want to keep the employee benefit that side but remove the equity. Agreed. But the problem is you're keeping one leg there and another leg there, which are of different amounts. So your ledger does not balance. What becomes the balance figure? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's uh, okay, guys. <laughs> right. So let's let's get the response so that we will be. It's retain earnings. Okay. So the problem is to go retain earnings. But well, they're now introducing a new ledger account which was not there before. It can't be changed. Which one? It becomes what? Okay. Let's let's hold on to that. Let's do it this way. Who has got the correct measurement? The subsidiary or the Parent company. The parent. So the subsidiary will need to come to where the parent is. Now, for the subsidiary, what are you taking? The employee benefit. Is the value of the employee benefit correct at good level? No. So what you want to do is you want to upgrade that value. Because they've been accounting for this as equity perspective, but from a group perspective, the group is saying we're going to settle this in cash. Therefore, the employee benefit cost that you've been accounting for using the fair value grant date should not be at fair value through grant date, but should be at fair value at reporting date. So we need to add in addition to the employee benefit. We're good then. Okay. Then I'm sure you look at the one where the subsidiary offers its employees the shares of its parent. Where they're sitting in the boardroom and like, okay, if you work at this year, we'll give you the shares of our parent. And they don't own even one share. Yeah, so let, let's, let's go and look at that. Um, I've already stolen 12 minutes of your time. I don't want to extend further. Okay. So, um, so guys, I think all I just want to say is let's practice a lot on our exam technique. Let's not just focus on technical only. Remember the six skills that are examinable. Your the understanding of the scenario, the understanding of the requirement, your communication skills, your uh, what's the other one? Your planning for your solution. Um, I forgot the sixth one. Okay. But those skills are very important for you. Don't practice oh, in number six technical. I forgot in the major. Okay. What we often do is we only study once, we only practice one skill, which is our technical skill, and we forget all other skills. So let's always make sure that we are polished now. Guys, um, all the best for your class. <laughs>